being said, um, I'd like to uh, introduce the speakers tonight. Uh, so we have Anna Wu of the Kiwanis Club of Rowland Heights, and she's going to give an overview about um, general fundraising. And then uh, we also have Tom Glass and Paul Schultz of the Kiwanis Club of uh, Weston, Connecticut, and they're going to talk more about uh, New England District and Bermuda District um, fundraising. So uh, with that in mind, uh, I'd like to turn it over to Anna, uh, who will give us her uh, presentation. Hi, everybody. Good evening. Uh, my name is Anna Wu, like Sam said. I'm actually joining you guys from California. I belong to the California, Nevada, Hawaii district. So um, I was, you know, I said good evening, but really it's only three o'clock over here. <laughs> so um, it's still pretty early in the day for us. Um, but I've been a part of Kiwanis, um, the Kiwanis family, for 23 years. I started at Builders Club. And um, from there in high school, I was in Keywinds, which is a district of Key Club International. And then as soon as I turned 18, I joined Kiwanis because I just couldn't wait to serve alongside all my Kiwanis family members who has been there for me the whole way. So today I'm here to talk about virtual fundraising. And some of you might have heard me talk about this before if um, you tune in to the Kiwanis International uh, Lunch with the Leader. Um, I'll try to keep it new and fresh for you guys. And again, feel free to ask questions in the chat. I wanna try to help you guys and, and, and understand what you guys wanna do um, rather than what we've done in the past. But a lot of what I'm gonna share are just ideas um, and a little bit of logistics of how to put it on. Um, I hope you guys enjoy it. So let me, without further ado, let me get that started. So like I said, I'm from California, Nevada, Hawaii district. Our theme this year is Ignite Your Passion. So hence the little torch on the side. Um, I'm on our governor's cabinet. I'm, also, I'm the communication and public relations chair. And I'm also on our foundation, which has um, recently changed our name to the um, California, Nevada, Hawaii Children's Fund. Um, so virtual fundraising, how this kind of all came about is because of a virtual wine tasting. Now, I don't know about your district, but my district just loves wine. Uh, maybe it's because we're in California, I'm not sure. Um, but basically we had an annual event every year, um, which focused around um, a crawl for a cause. So we visited local um, small businesses, um, pubs, wine shops, and we play game and we have drinks and we kind of just enjoy each other's company. But that event was originally planned for March. Um, and all of you guys know something happened in March, right? All of us were forced to go into our homes and all the events were canceled. And at that time, we really didn't know what to do because we had our signature event in June. And so we needed to still raise the funds because at that time, we all assumed this would be over by June. <laughs> Little did we know. Um, so anyways, we plan an event at the end of May, May 30th, and it was a virtual wine tasting. We partnered with our local wine shop and we charged $45 um, because it was our first time doing it. We didn't know how much people were willing to pay uh, being that they were at home. But since then, there's been a lot of other virtual wine tastings, some of them going up to over $100. So for our $45, they received um, four half bottles um, so two whites and two reds. And our wine shop had a wine expert that was going to be the one that logged on to actually conduct the event. But she also bottled it for us and put it into these little kits. So um, we had three Kiwanis clubs come together for this event because when it's a virtual event, it doesn't matter where you are because we're all going to be logging on um, as long as they were close enough to be able to either drive to pick up the kids or we did batch pickup. Um, so I lived a little closer to Diamond Bar, Diamond Bar in Arcadia, for those of you who don't know, which is probably all of you, <laughs> is about 30 miles apart. But in Los Angeles, 30 miles can be over an hour doing traffic. So um, I went to Monrovia, which was kind of halfway, and picked up about 20 of the kits. And uh, those people who signed up for it, they put on the form whether they would like to pick up directly in Monrovia, because maybe they work near there, or if they wanted to pick up at a closer location to where they lived, which is closer to where I live. So we dispute, uh, distributed these kits all around. Um, and it was also really fun getting to see people. Um, at that time, it was like two, almost, approaching three months, two months, where we haven't seen a lot of people in real life. Um, so it was, it was a 
treat. But also on the night of May 30th, um, 7 p.m., we all logged on to our computer on Zoom and our wine expert, our sommelier, she logged on and she walked us through every single wine. And she told us what region they were from, you know, all the aspect. And we actually, that I made that cheese board myself, but it was um, the next time we did this event, we're going to add on the opportunity to not only pick up the wine, but also add on an additional cheese plate for additional $20. And obviously it doesn't cost us $20 to mass produce a cheese plate. So just additional revenues. Um, so for this event, we actually sold, um, well, we actually had people that logged on was closer to about 40 to 50 people, but we sold more tickets than that. A lot of people purchased the wine kit in support and they couldn't log on that night or um, they just wanted to enjoy the wine themselves. Um, and another option for a lot of people for virtual fundraiser is to record it so people can enjoy it later at their own pace at their own home um, at a different time. So. Um, that is kind of the start of all this virtual fundraising. But since then, it's really taken off and we've done a lot of different ideas. But one thing I want to mention that it, no matter what idea you do, it's the same model. So I'm going to go through a few more ideas and then I'll go through the logistics of it. So this is our San Diego Kids Club. They're a super fun club and they partnered with the La Mesa Kiwanis Club and they put together a murder mystery. And the concept was that there was this couple that was about to get married, but the pandemic happened and their wedding got canceled. So instead of canceling the wedding, they sent out invites to all their guests to log on to Zoom to participate in their wedding. So we all logged on to Zoom as their wedding guest and um, doing this, you know, introduction, we get to meet the family members and all this stuff. And they had scripts that they were reading and doing this process, the groom got murdered. And so we, as all of the participants, all the guests witnessed certain portions of it. So we had to go into breakout rooms to try to solve the murder. It was really fun, really interactive. And for them, it cost $10 per person or $20 per couple. And it didn't matter how many people they got on there, they were gonna put on their show. So the more people, the more revenues, the more fun, uh, the more interactions, and really the more ways to engage people who are members and as well as people who are not members. So as you can see on this invite and the previous one, we all had a link to sign up. So for a virtual event, number one of the logistics is getting signups. And what we um, suggest is creating a Google form or if you have a website, you can add it as a feature on your website where you provide them a link, um, a way to sign up. So the best way is Google Forms, website, a way they could click on it and they could just sign up. We've also seen people do signups via Facebook, where on Facebook you could create an event page and they could sign up and they could even purchase a ticket through the Facebook or they could just sign up and then they could tell you that they're for sure coming and give you all the information. They could even sign up via email. You know, they could sign up giving them a phone number for them to call your secretary and being like, hey, I really want to come to this event. How do I pay you? So that's part two. On this right here, it mentions the method of payment. Their method of payment is Cash App. And that's an app on your phone that you can collect payment. We used Venmo. Um, so before I, I dive into the second part, I'm gonna go over some more ideas. So this is a virtual paint and craft night. One of our other Qantas Club did this um, about two months ago, um, but one of my Qantas Clubs is actually doing this for an installation. And the reason for that is an installation can sometimes get a little long, can get a little boring, but um, even more so now that we're via Zoom, when it's so easy for people to tune out, to turn off that camera, to not give the recognition to you know, someone who's been secretary maybe multiple times. So what we decided to come up with is we're having a wine and paint night where we provide them with the, all the equipment and we have a teacher come on and she walks them through how to paint that photo. But halfway through, we're going to have an intermission. And that's when we're going to come on and we're going to do a lot of our recognition, a lot of our installations, um, installing a new presidents, our lieutenant governor is making a speech. And then after that, we're going to go back to the paint night. So that way, it kind of forces them to stay throughout our installation because they want to finish their painting. Um, so like I said, number one is getting signups, however you get it. Number two is collecting their money, um, however you want to collect it. They can, you can have them mail you a check. You can use electronic payments. Um, you can even say, hey, when you come get the supplies, you can drop off cash. Um, so that is totally up to your club, how you want to collect that money. 
Number three is the supplies. You need to get them um, all of the supplies that they need to have this event. So for example, this is a virtual cooking lesson. We partnered with one of our local um, a sushi shops or a local pizza shop. Um, I don't know if you guys have them in New England, but, but Pyology, Pizza Rev, um, all of those places where you could go and they make a dough out and you could pick out your toppings. Well, we talked to them and their businesses had dropped dramatically right after the pandemic hit. So they made these kits where they give you the pizza dough wrapped in um, saran wrap so it wasn't gonna get dry and they give you a, a toppings. So we all log on to Zoom together and we all taught everybody like, oh, you know, make sure to press out your dough, make sure to make it thinner or thicker. Um, now we're gonna apply the butter and then we're gonna apply the sauce. All of that came in the kit and we did it together. So one of the great things about virtual fundraising is that even though we have to be apart during this time, we can still feel together as long as we're doing the same things at the same time. So we can still have that bonding moment and um, have fun together. Um, sushi kit, same thing. We had a local pokey shop that had um, dropped in business. And so we we wanted to do this event. We actually haven't done the, the sushi making class, but I think it would be the same concept where um, we provide the supplies. They go pick it up at the store or pick it up from a member and um, we all make it together on Zoom. Um, um, my best friend, um, John actually had went to this um, through another nonprofit that he belongs to, um, a local plotting class. The great thing about this is you can mail them all the equipment for this. Um, for most succulents, they won't die um, that fast. So if you're gonna mail it you know, locally, uh, two day air or anything like that, uh, you can mail everything to them. And same thing with the paint night. With the paint night, what we're actually thinking about doing is I have an Amazon Prime account. I could go on there, I could price out how much all the stuff is. So say for example, I charge $45. My supplies that I'm sending to you uh, maybe altogether comes out to $15. Um, and then our teacher, uh, we would pay her a fee. And then the rest of that $45 is all profit. So we can go on there, we can select who we want to mail to. Um, when they sign up, we ask for their mailing address so that we can send them the supplies. So those are the three steps. The last step is getting online and having fun together. Um, I think that's the best step. Um, so virtual games night is really also an, another one that's really popular. It could be a fundraiser or it could just be a social night. Um, for virtual games night, we've seen um, one club challenge another club to a family feud and that one club can be a team and we can type chats to each other to help each other, uh, but more like, um, you know, each person gets a turn, just like in Family Feud. And how you can make it a fundraiser is you could charge $10, $15 per head. Um, and the club that wins it takes all the money. So it's a great fundraiser for the winning club and also gives you an incentive to try extra hard. Bingo, um, there's a lot of new apps and platforms coming out where it allows you to do bingo online. Um, you could do it the traditional way where you send people cards and you call out the number and they thought the cards when it's their turn to win, they could show you their card and you could be like, all right, Dave is a winner <laughs> with that card. Um, trivia night, same thing. Um, another one that's become extremely popular lately is a virtual walkathon. I think it's just because people are sick of being in their house and they want to get out and walk and they want to walk with their friends. But um, if you can't beat them, be there with them in person, a lot of times we host a virtual walkathon. So we set a specific time. Everybody's going out to walk. Some of us logs on to Facebook Live to share with everybody if we're fundraising for a specific cause like Relay for Life. Um, some of us gets onto Zoom and we walk together. Um, and we play music, you know, to different songs that we're all walking to, um, as well as a lot of clubs who used to host walkathons or um, even marathons. Um, they've done virtual, where um, you tell a specific time and you start at a starting point and you share a photo of you starting at the starting point. And obviously it's an honor system. You could jump into a car and get to the finish line really fast, right? <laughs> uh, but you have to get to the you know, 10K, uh, you measure on your phone or you guys identify a point that you already know. And then when you get there, you take a photo, you post it, whoever posts the first photo makes it to their finish line of their version of a 10K. So it's, it's all for fun and all for charity. 
Um, and, and that brings me to no matter what your virtual fundraiser is, you need to make sure that you let your people know that the cause, yes, it's a magic show, but why are we having this magic show? To raise money for our SLPs, uh, maybe to raise money for school supplies, uh, maybe to raise money for the homeless, or um, you know, maybe to raise uh, money for hospitals or uh, PPE supplies to donate to hospitals or um, old folks homes or whatever it is that your project is. Make sure they know that we're not just there to take their money and to have fun, but yes, we're gonna have fun and, and do it for a good cause. Um, a virtual mixology class. One of our Kiwanis Club is actually doing a mixology and moochie tasting class. Those two things don't sound like they go together, but we're, we're putting a spin on it and making the drinks really fun. And we're putting little bottles of vodka, of all the different ingredients that would go into that drink. And we also have the option to add on um, shakers and muddlers and stirlers and all that professional equipment because we're buying them from um, a distributor for um, professionals. So we're getting a better price on that. So they get to add that on and we could be like, okay, you're gonna muddle your mint and your strawberries or your blueberries. And then you're gonna add this and you add that. And we're kind of enjoying that experience together. Um, oh, and then another one that's actually raised a lot of money. If you're if you're shooting for that, you know, hundred thousand dollars and um, or even more, um, virtual auctions have become extremely popular. And um, there's a lot of other platforms than um, than this one. This is Bid for Good. Um, there, there's a lot of other ones coming out. One that uh, app that we're working with for virtual fundraising is called Roots. And that allows you to partner with local businesses, but they're adding on an auction feature coming soon. Um, so virtual auctions are great. You still collect the same stuff. Members can still donate gift baskets and you can do it via Zoom where you guys are interacting via Zoom. We're having fun just like we would at a gala or at a fundraiser, but um, you're sharing your screen and you're showing all the different items in like a slideshow and people can go online and they could bid and you could leave it open for the length of your event or you could leave it open for 24 hours or for however long you want. Um, you could bid memorabilia, you know, collectibles, whatever that you guys normally would done in person, you guys could now do it virtually. So these are just some of the ideas that I had. I, um, and of course the most important thing is to go and execute these ideas, right? This is just a fun little slide I wanted to share um, to have fun. But here's my contact information and new fundraising ideas are really popping out daily. So it's impossible for me to incorporate every single idea. What's most important for you is to find out what your members are most interested in. If they love going outdoors and doing a walk, then yeah, you should definitely host a walkathon. If they are um, really into wine or really into games, whatever that is, then you plan that event. Um, whatever event it is, it's the same model. It's the same three steps. Logistically, it's a little heavy in the beginning, but think about all the money you're saving by not having a physical event. When you have a physical event, you have to rent a space. Um, you know, for walkathons, you have to pay to block off roads and rent equipment. So, and then the great thing is you give, you purchase an amount of supplies for the amount of signups. For, so for example, for our mixology class, if we have 10 signups, we're gonna prepare 10 kits. If we have 20 signups, we're gonna prepare 20 kits. There's no overhead possibility of lost um, in terms of, sorry, I wanted to stop sharing that so you can see me <laughs> and we can, to open the floors for questions, but um, but yeah, there's less chance of losing money, and there's more chance of you know getting members that you haven't seen in a while because maybe they've moved a little farther or they're working from home. Um, a lot of the supplies, depending on where your members are, if your members are all really close, if all of your members are within 20 miles, then maybe you could do something with a fresh food product like pizza or sushi or pasta or baking. Baking's become extremely popular, like cakes, bun cakes, all that stuff. But if your members are a little farther apart or your division is a little bit bigger, um, you might wanna do something like a paint night where the paint's not gonna spoil. You can mail the paint to them up to, you know, whenever they sign up, send it out so they can have the supplies ready for that night. So I know I covered a lot in a short time. If anybody wants, has any questions, uh, feel, f oh, I see that there's some in the chat, but you can also feel free to unmute yourself and um, 
ask questions. Yes, the $45 does include the wine. So um, cost versus price, yes. So that was our first fundraiser. So we charged um, $45. We actually paid $30 to the wine shop um, because it included the four wines, included the bottles, you know, that she had to use to bottle it, the, the bags and all of that stuff, the labels, and it included her time. She was a licensed, um, I always say this word wrong, um, Sumier. Um, a wine expert. She was a licensed wine expert. So she came online and she spent an hour and a half answering questions, describing wine. So that $30 included everything. And they, these were really, really good bottles of wine. We actually looked up the prices of the wines. A lot of the wines um, retail for over $30 a bottle. And so you're getting four half bottles. So in a way you're getting two bottles of around $20 to $30 of uh, wine. So it's very, very worth it for um, the participants. But at the same time, um, it's very worth it for her because she's buying the wine in bulk. So she's getting like a wholesaler's discount. Um, so she's making a little extra money because her wine shop is closed and she's not able to sell, but also she's getting additional business. And that's another thing. If you talk to the wine expert, if they own a business, they're promoting their business at the same time. If anybody from the participants list um, later goes to purchase a bottle of wine from her, we can get a percentage of how much they purchase. So it's ongoing um, additional funds. So we were only making $15 a person, but again, it was our first time doing it. Um, our foundation's planning on putting one together and I suspect they're gonna charge um, $100 a person. So um, let me go back to the chat. Uh, can you talk about how clubs can set up accounts on platforms like Venmo, Cash Apps and fees that they are charged? Okay, perfect. So I personally love Venmo. And the reason I love Venmo is because I'm cheap. <laughs> I don't want our clubs to lose any bit of that money. So Venmo doesn't charge a fee. There's no fees, um, especially if you're, you know, sending it. Venmo is a personal platform. So someone in your club has to set up that account as a personal platform. The only catch for Venmo is it doesn't allow you to set up a business account. So for example, if your treasurer agrees, they can the treasurer can set up the account and the Venmo account will be under their name, but you can also rename the Venmo account to the Kiwanis Club of, um, you know, Baltimore or Kiwanis Club of whatever it is. And you can set the notification so one person sends you money to go to multiple people. So like three people can get a notification anytime a money comes. So that's like the oversight for the app. The cash app, again, it's a personal app. There's no fees involved. And also when you sign up, um, you get $10 free uh, for signing up. And if you refer someone to sign up, you get $10. So the kids club actually offered a discount where it says, hey, our event, they had a different event where it was $20, but if you sign up and you use a referral code, we'll give you $5 off because they're getting $10. So really they're actually making an additional $5 for anybody who uses their referral code. That makes sense. PayPal is one of those that you can actually sign up using your club account. And if your club is a 501c3, they will get a reduced percentage. But um, last I checked, it was about 2.7% and there's a 30 cents per transaction fee. But in the long run, it's still worth it if you're doing an auction and people are buying $100 worth of stuff, you're losing $2.70, oh, plus 30 cents. So you're losing $3. Um, not a huge amount to lose versus money you wouldn't have collected otherwise. Um, there's other apps like Squared. Um, people can use Zella, Z E. L L E, and that's directly from their bank, um, Bank of America, Chase, Wells Fargo. I believe they all use Zelle, and that has no fees as well. So there, uh, there's a lot of different options. Um, I have a PDF that I'm going to send to the, your conference coordinator, and I think if he he can make it available on the Facebook or on your website, or maybe he can even email it out to you guys. I'm not sure. Um, but that tells you step-by-step step how to set up a Google form, how to sign up for a Venmo account, how to um, start a, a schedule, a Zoom meeting for your actual event. Um, any other questions? Okay, uh, if that's uh, no other questions or whatever, thank you so much, Anna. Um, really, really great ideas. Um, 
So with that being said, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, our next speakers, Tom Glass and Paul Schultz, who are going to talk about their uh, virtual 5K and uh, fun run. Paul, I think I, you're muted. I unmute myself then. You're good. You're good now. Okay. So uh, Tom and I are going to talk about two different areas. The, the race that we, we started with was, is eight years old. This is our ninth year. And until this time, we had basically done the race as the fundraiser. Uh, the race founders were two of the club members, Don and Phyllis Gary, and they did all the heavy lifting to get it started. And I helped at the start, but I began helping Phyllis more after, um, after Don died. Uh, the key factors to starting up in an event like this, which is going to go on for multiple years, is you have to have club member involvement, interest and in race planning and the detailed committee heads who have to lead these groups to, uh, for the day of the race you have a lot of things going on. We use over 100 members at, during the race just to do all of the um, everything from race safety to manning water stations. Uh, we also use school clubs, uh, get involved with the Boy Scouts, the key club, the difference clubs at school, and they they do various things in the race as groups. And uh, that helps us spread the workload out a little bit. Um, the key thing on an event like this, whether it's virtual or actual, it, we found out you have to start getting the sponsors early because they, they're going to give the race uh, financial stability. And if it also, they, they are a big factor in helping to recruit teams somewhat. This all worked very well. We had a half marathon and a 5K and it went along very successfully for eight years. Then COVID-19 came along and you can't socially dense distance a race start. It doesn't work that well. So um, after looking at it, we, the club and the foundation made a decision to do a dual virtual fundraising, which is to have a donor drive and a race. So I'm doing the race and uh, Tom Glass is doing the donor drive. So we're gonna split the presentation in terms of who's doing it. First, on the race, uh, you have to do things a little differently. And for our COVID-19, and I don't know how to put it up big on the screen, we went with the uh, bandana mask, which you can use as the COVID-19 mask. You can use it in cold weather because our race is in October. And skiers know these very well, but they actually have a fundraising logo, which says the race is virtual, the hunger is real, because the drive is to uh, raise money for the Connecticut Food Bank and the Western Social Services. Um, we modified some things in the race like that. There's a challenge coin versus a finisher's medal, things like that. I don't know if everybody knows how a virtual race runs. So I'm going to outline it for you. The runners can register for the distance and the, and the race. In ours, they pay to register and they also are asked to donate. And what they get in return for a race memorabilia is based on the combination of their registration and their donation. And we have it pegged every $25, like $25, $50, $75, $100 for donation, an extra donation. And um, then we send them, once a month, we uh, we send everybody who's done it, donated or registered in that month, the memorabilia ahead of time. The, um, they can run alone. Many of the virtual races now, the people don't run alone, they run with their buddies, usually the ones they train with anyway. So you'll get, if one signs up, uh, we, you know, we have a team function and a running, running club function, so they can sign up for that and they can collect uh, race buddies to run with and what have you. Um, that's much more popular than just signing up and running alone if, you, if you're going to do it. You need to have a, a 
a site that can incorporate that feature. Um, when they make the race, which our race is October 25th this year. It's the last Sunday of October every year. But the week before they have any day they want to run. So they don't have to run in the rain and the snow and the sleet. They can run on a sunny day. And then they report their times back. And once the October 25th is finished, we publish the results just like an actual race. You know, you have age, gender groups, you have grandmasters for the old people like me and um, things like that. And we're, we're experimenting with adding team competitions through services like Strava, because Strava will automatically report to us. So it saves some of the uh, labor costs of, of inputting the data and everything of who went on. Uh, we found out uh, from other races and also from our own, you can't run a virtual race and not give somebody a prize. You have to give away prizes and you have to give goodies to them because that's part of their incentive for running the race. They want to say they did a half marathon, even though it wasn't at, at, in Weston at the reservoir. And uh, so we have a bunch of memorabilia that we give out for various ones. There's a hat with the race logo up here in the Kiwanis K. And then we have several other items, but the most popular one seems to be the challenge coin because one side has a, a special logo for the Connecticut Ch uh, Children Relief Fund and the other side has the Kiwanis K on it. And um, that's gonna be one of the big ones that goes out. Uh, I would still recommend if anybody's gonna do this, you have to use a, a website that's designed to run a race. You can't just do a virtual race on the, on the cheap. There are, we use a website called uh, uh, Run Sign Up. So there's, there's no charge for using Run Sign Up. They just process the card transactions. So it keeps the cost down, but at the same time, a lot of the things you'd have to do manually you don't have to do there because the computer's doing them for you as you go along. Makes a big difference. Uh, Don covers it. We also, they have a companion called donor website, which is just for the kind of things Anna was talking about where um, you can accept donations, you can issue tickets to events, you can do all sorts of stuff like that. You don't have to collect all the data you do for a runner. We found out that uh, donors Runners have no problem giving you their age because they want to be in the age bracket they're competing with. But donors don't like to say how old they are all the time. They don't even like to say whether they're male or female. So we collect a lot less data for the donors than we, than we would for runners. And that's one reason we use two different sites. Um, that's basically what we're doing on the virtual. We haven't finished these drives. So it's hard to say what the, uh, what the effect will be of doing it both ways. And so we have to look, kind of look and see, and uh, we'll, know it, we'll know October 25th. But that's basically my part. And uh, I assume Tom is somewhere out there in the ether on the, on the other. Is he signed in? Yes, Tom is signed in. Okay, Tom, it's your turn. The unmute is on the bottom left uh, corner, Tom. Am I okay? Yep. You're in. You're in. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Hey, Paul, thanks a lot. Anna, thank you as well. Um, as Paul said, we broke this into two plans. First plan was to make sure we got the runners for the uh, half marathon and the 5K. Um, Paul was a, uh, didn't go into it too much, but we're talking about three to 4,000 runners that we have on emails that we can get to in no time at all, uh, which Paul is taking care of. And there's a site designed specifically for the runners. Paul was kind enough to develop the site as well for donors. Uh, so we have a one site for donors and one site for runners. Um, to give you an idea, we started this whole thing with a planning committee back in March, the latter part of March, and meet once a week 
uh, on Zoom, like we're doing now, and discuss our overall planning and time setting. Um, give you an idea, we started phase one back in uh, April, uh, where we went to Kiwanis of Weston and we asked for donations along with some restricted funds that were available. And that was completed at the end of June. We raised close to $30,000 on that one. And now we're into phase two. Phase two is going after the members that did not uh, contribute to the first part of the, of the uh, phase. And um, 11 other clubs within Fairfield County. We have an entire ad campaign set up and ready to go. At least the first three ads are completed. Uh, that will go out to 3,000 homes in Weston. Uh, Paul will be able to handle that. I'll handle the other side of it. We've got to, as I said, 10 clubs across Fairfield County that have all agreed to put it on their websites to put it on uh, Facebooks where individuals have that. They're all in line with doing that. Um, we're looking at a number of people who will put it on their websites business-wise and uh, LinkedIn as well, already on my Facebook uh, account at this point, which has close to 400 people. Uh, to give you a quick idea, by the middle of September, we expect to be hitting 10,000 people weekly. Uh, don't know what that's gonna uh, uh, translate to in terms of overall revenue. Um, but our overall goal, I would think, and Paul, correct me if I'm wrong on this, we might be looking at $50,000 overall on this one, going to, as Paul said, the Connecticut Food Bank and the Western Social Services through our foundation. Uh, let's see where else. Uh, we're gonna be on town websites. We're gonna be on different organizational. There's a ton of organizations within Weston that have agreed to put it up on their sites. Um, and across Fairfield County, people are using their own databases to send that out as well. Mine has about 600 businesses on it and that'll be going to that group as well. Um, when we put it together on this side of it for donors, I was able to put together a advertising committee that is fairly got a great deal of depth to it. The director of um, content for Viacom, CBS is one of our writers. And I was very fortunate to get the creative director who wrote the Heartbeat of America campaign for our General Motors to be the other participant on our ad committee along with myself. Um, as I said, Paul designed the site, made it simple. You click through the ad and click right onto our site to donate. It's very simple. Uh, to give you an idea, we have been doing in-person wine tasting for at least seven or eight years. We haven't done it this year, of course, because of COVID. We've done the road race for nine years. This would be nine years. We're doing this virtual. And we ran a dog jamboree for two years before we ran into COVID. Uh, all of them drew an enormous crowd. To give you an example, uh, Paul with the road race uh, had 500 runners for the uh, half marathon and several hundred for the uh, 5K. And there were about 100 kids for the fun run. Uh, as he said, we used about 100 of our own members uh, to help run this. On the dog jamboree, we had about 90 volunteers. Uh, we had 600 attendees, all paid. We had 200 dogs. We had five people who were doing um, uh, lectures and we had demonstrations from across the state of Connecticut. So it was an all day event and it raised quite a bit of money. 
we do things like uh, the Mardi Gras evening, but COVID put us behind everything and now we're doing the virtual run. Uh, any questions? Because this, is, this takes a lot of people. No? Okay. Paul, you want to take it back? Yeah, I think um, the ones we're, we're trying to run uh, are ones that operationally require a pretty, pretty big commitment from the clubs. So uh, Anna made the point that you have to do things the members are interested in because you're going to be asking them to come out and help. And it's not just a one day thing because by the time you set it up and you run it and then you break it down, you've got a solid week of people having to help you every day. And none of these kind of events you can do alone. It's right. all got to be groups who are working on part of it. Uh, the virtual makes it harder to get because you can't get the people together as easily to work out details. It, it's, uh, it takes, a, we found out, I'm saying it takes what, twice as much time, Tom? Yeah. At least to just get things moving and get everybody in agreement than you would if you were all sitting in the room and you said, let's do it tonight. Um, that, that'd be one of the key things I'd tell any club that was planning one is allow yourself a lot more planning time and uh, as much of the planning that in Zoom or using some one of the other methodologies, but keep it on a schedule. Don't just, oh, we're gonna have a meeting tomorrow. Just like Tom said, you have it every week and you have it at the same time. So people can't say they forget when to, when to sign in. Yeah, I think, I, I think every one of the things that we did in the past, uh, an in-person type of an event or, or a fundraiser, uh, we had a lot of our members participate, but we went at least six months out to design how we're going to attack whatever the event or project was going to be. Um, and we would meet once a week, even for the dog jamboree. I know for the reservoir run, you guys were meeting and the wine tasting took as much time. Um, we Not as many people to run it, but as much time to plan it. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Uh, and, they, and they were willing to put in the time. That's why they were successful. And it could come up with a way on the wine tasting where uh, you could get the fragrance of the wine over Zoom. That would be an, that would be the, the key <laughs> to the success. Yeah. Smell-o-vision, right? I think that's what one TV show called it. Not invented yet, unfortunately. <laughs> they tried that 15 years ago. It didn't work. <laughs> That's basically all I, w I oh. had to add. Yeah. Now, if you want copies of the ads, let me know. Um, we've got the first three set. We've got three more that we're working on. We'll probably have one a week uh, going to an enormous list that we have. Uh, so let me know if you want to see what those ads look like and how, it, how they were designed by this group. Okay, well, thank you uh, to all speakers, Paul, Tom, and Anna. Um, I'd like to take this time to do a quick Q and A. Uh, we only had, I think, one uh, question asked in the chat regarding this. Um, Marina asked, "Is the road race run by one club, or is it a division project?" One club. Western. One club. Western. Yes, so, one club, Western, Western Kiwanis. We, we, we have a lot of community participation. So the club runs it, and most of the club members participate. But you have the police, the fire, the EMS, the clubs at the school, the key club, uh, the athletic teams. They all come over and either run the race or they do, a, uh, do things like man a water station or something like that. So there's a lot of participation by the local community to help the club. 
And uh, that's that's really key to having the interest in the whole community. Yeah. And doing something because if you don't, you're just kind of throwing emails out and people aren't interested. But if they're somehow involved or their child is involved, then they're going to learn more about it and, and get involved too. The same thing with the dog jamboree. We did the same thing. We got the entire community involved. Um, David had a question that says, what email platform do you use for such a large scale emails? I um, think, um, I use, go ahead. Um, I use run sign up and run, there's a reason you use run sign up. They have a, a great capability, not only for email mass mailing, but there's a, if someone takes, take me off the list, it's automatically done. I like to set it up so the computer's doing a lot of the busy work because people make mistakes. But if somebody clicks, take me off, this gets, they gets, we don't lose their name, but they don't get the next, next, la next letter. Um, they also can uh, go out to any of the Facebook platforms and any of the Facebook charity events and uh, bring those back in and we know where they came from. So source tracing is, is pretty important for some of the stuff we're doing because we need to know what appeal, what, what brought in the draw. Because this is experimental, it's all virtual. So yep. uh, the learning curve is, is there for everybody. Uh, on the donor side of it, it's what we try to do is build off everybody's email in forms of websites, in uh, Facebook, whatever it may be, and ask them to piggyback on our direction in terms of uh, getting the message across. And people have been terrific. And we've added to, to a lot of our uh, audience factor by doing that. The other aspect is we piggybacked on a couple of things. We used Channel 8, we used Channel 12, and a number of the local uh, WeB 108 and radio. Uh, we we went, actually went out, and uh, we meet on Saturday mornings when we meet in person, and we asked one person from each one of those places to come in and speak to us. So we got the lead anchor on 12, and we got the lead anchor on 8 to come in and talk to us. Now we have their email. Now we were able to get to them and they turn around and use it on their stations. So I would encourage you to bring in a speaker from your local area communication channels and radio. And then we had another question that says, um, for me, uh, what size of virtual fundraising was I talking about? Really all depends on your event. Um, the La Jolla Club who runs a 10K and marathon they had um, the same number of signups as they always had. So they had um, hundreds of people signed up. Um, for the wine tasting where we all, for a, like, you know, a club event where we all log on, um, we're usually looking at about a hundred people um, and, or, you know, anywhere from 50 to hundred people, I should say, for a cooking or a making class. And for that, um, we normally just email them and we BCC them directly from our account. But yeah, definitely, you can use MailChimp. That works as well. I personally hate constant contacts. I feel like they rip you off. So I'm a big fan of MailChimp. We do use MailChimp if um, if there was multiple communications that was going to go out. But for usually for like a virtual wine tasting or cooking, there's just one email with the Zoom link. Um, and we coordinate the pickup um, directly with each person. The, uh, just for your information, uh, on run sign up, which is where I use the email the capability that's there, the driver underneath that is MailChimp. Yeah. But, it, but, but it, we don't pay anything for it that way. So that makes a big difference. On Facebook, for the runner acquisition, I keep it to a 50 mile radius for any Facebook advertising that we're doing. And it's only for people who are interested in, in running and in sports. Uh, Tom does it differently for, for donors because remember ours is supporting the Connecticut Food Bank. Whereas I draw, I want to draw runners from uh, New York, Westchester County and places like that because there's a lot of people there who run. 
So that's a difference in, in market area by, by what you're trying to do. Yeah. And also, if you guys are using signups through Google Form, um, they fill out all that information and then Google Form puts it all into an Excel document for you. So okay. it's, you can just highlight the address column, I mean, the email address column and email all of those addresses really easily. Um, one of our clubs runs a cycling race um, and he has 700 um, cyclers sign up uh, for a race. It's a collegial cycling race. Oh, we're he asked. Huh? Were they all oh, wearing masks? The, actually, we had the event right before COVID hit. So <laughs> that, that event escaped the, the mass cancellation. But we did have another one originally scheduled for October. That one's going to now going to be pushed into 2021. Um, but yeah. <laughs> yeah we, no, we, you know, Connecticut came out with a bunch of restrictions on what to do when you had people together. And yeah. we found it impossible to actually try to run a race uh, plus, we use the school facilities. So if I tried to get a thousand people into the gym, they did, they Connecticut did not want me to have a thousand people, some with masks and some without, in the gym. I mean, it, that's why we went virtual for this this fall. Yeah, the same thing with the cycling race. The race itself, when you're on a bike, you're actually far away now from other people. But the problem was um, all the sponsors. They normally hang like they have a booth. It's kind of like a fair, like, you know, atmosphere. Yeah, and that do. was definitely not going to be conducive no. during um, this pandemic. So, yeah, a lot of stuff are going virtual. <laughs> Couldn't even have a selfie banner. Well, thank you guys so much for having me. And I loved hearing about the walk um, or, or the run. Um, I, I got some great ideas from your district that I'm going to go share with some other districts as well. So thank you so much, Paul and Tom. That was really useful for me too. Thank Anytime you. you want to contact me, you let, let us know. And we'll, we'll be, I'll be happy to help you feedback anything on the slide or anything. Awesome. All right. So uh, thank you to all the attendees. Thank you especially to uh, our presenters. Um, the next session will start at uh, 7 p.m. and that's about uh, that's regarding uh, club grant opportunities. So uh, feel free to um, come to that one as well. Uh, with that being said, uh, I think that this workshop is uh, concluded. So thank you uh, to everybody.